studio fire and saved the musician. He didn't want to do a bio, so um, I did one. He served and retired from 25 years from the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department, where he started out as a driver engineer and set a record with three working fires on his first shift. What? So that was an eye-opener. You could have changed your mind real fast. <laughs> He's now the museum's archivist, and he also helped rebuild the little trinket out there and another one. He did one and two engines, one and two. And as I said, at the last minute, he told me it was there. So y'all can go out and take some some picture ops. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Like she said, I'm Mike Grady with the uh, Fort Lauderdale Fire and Safety Museum. And um, before I even start, I, I talked to a couple of people here already who said, I've never heard of that. Didn't know it existed. Well, I guess that's part of the reason that I'm here today is to <clears throat> bring some attention to it. Well, the Fort Lauderdale Fire and Safety Museum was actually a working fire station. It was built in 1927 and was taken out of service in 2005. So it was there for quite a while. Now, over a period of time, you know, being an old building and having um, <clears throat> suffered the effects of time and weather and a lot of other things, um, it just was no longer. Uh, the city didn't want to <clears throat> deal with that anymore. <clears throat> the city also was building all brand new fire stations. So the city of Fort Lauderdale now has all brand new fire stations except for one that is still around from the times I came on. And, but it's going to be gone pretty soon too and it's going to be replaced with a brand new station. Now. <clears throat> the Fort Lauderdale Fire Museum, the, the, actually the, uh, the station, was built in 1927, like I said, and at the time it was built, it was only the third fire station in the city of Fort Lauderdale. At the top to that time, there were only two, one on the north side of the New River and one on the south side of the New River. And they were called North Side Station and South Side Station appropriately because of the, the river was the defining part of the city. And at that time, all of the trade in Fort Lauderdale was taken care of on the New River when we were trading with the Seminoles and, and training, uh, trading with a lot of other people. Everything was done on the rivers. Well, when they were getting ready to build this new fire station, just for the year before that, we had a major hurricane, the Hurricane of 26. It was called the Hurricane of 26 because back then they didn't have names for them. But the hurricane was a very, very damaging hurricane. And I think I've been here before and her, her, someone was speaking about that hurricane. Uh, well, anyway, this fire station was going to be built in what's called the Sailboat Bend neighborhood. Now the people in the Sailboat Bend neighborhood realizing there was going to be a fire station built in their neighborhood were hoping that the fire station would look imposing or look like a fire station or something. So they asked if you build something like that can you, can you have it build it so it looks nice and blends in with the neighborhood. So uh, in order to do that, they employed Francis Abru, who was a, an architect and designer who built and designed many, many of the homes in South Florida, in Miami, in Hollywood, Allendale, uh, Boca, all over the place. He was famous for his Spanish Mediterranean designs using tile roofs and arched uh, windows and doorways and such. Well, <clears throat> before I go on anymore, I'm going to play a video for you. Um, so I need somebody to do that. And the video 
is about the fire station, much of what I already said, and the restoration of this building. And um, it's a very, very interesting video. Um, and I was there for a lot of it. In fact, I used to be stationed at this uh, fire station when it was a fire station. And I've got, I've got some stories about that too. But, um, so I've got another video that follows that. But I've, I've, I've got plenty to tell you. Um, so I'm waiting for, okay. So I'm going to start with uh, this video now that's going to, it's the restoration of the fire station and how we were able to successfully restore the building and to be able to save our history and turn this into the Fort Lauderdale Fire and Safety Museum. Let me see how we're doing. I think we got something going here. All right, here we go. Thank you. Can we get a little more volume? being devastated by a hurricane in 1926, Fort Lauderdale wanted to make a statement that it was going to come back better than ever. A new fire station was needed, and it would be the perfect show place to make that statement. Francis Abreu, the famous architect, was commissioned in 1927 with orders to build a very special fire station. His design for Fire Station 3's rotunda, chandelier, wood beam ceiling, eyebrow windows, turned columns, crown molding, fireplace and fountain met that order perfectly. Unfortunately, deterioration from years of neglect, followed by damage from Hurricane Wilma, reduced the fire station to near derelict status. If a photo is worth a thousand words, here's an encyclopedia on the history, deterioration, restoration, and reopening of historic Fire Station 3 as the Fort Lauderdale Fire and Safety Museum Watch the amazing volunteers as they accomplish miracles.
is the day we've been waiting for, huh? <laughs> Everything looks nice around here today, too. And I'm Debbie, I'm Jim's wife. What is your name? Yeah, huh? Linda. Linda, nice to meet you, Linda.
Well, I hope y'all, excuse me. I hope y'all enjoyed that video because I tell you what, when I was sitting there just now watching that again, it still got to my heart because to understand the condition of the building and what it took to get it where it is now and all the people who put so much into it really, really, really got me. Well, anyway, um, there is quite a history to that building itself as a fire station. One of the histories of that fire station is really, really interesting. Um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. As you saw in the video, you saw that we have a monument there, and that's to all the firefighters who have worked for the city of Fort Lauderdale who passed away and died. So we have a monument to all of them. We have the monument for the people who have died in line of duty. We had two people who died in line of duty. And the rest of them were firefighters who um, ha have passed away, whether they were still on the job or they retired. And uh, every time I go, and I stand around the museum and I, I rather I look at the monument it gets me because many of the names I see on there are people who I really have worked with and known so ah, it, it, it really really gets me and so uh, obviously the fire museum and its monument mean a lot to me. I was going to give you a little bit more history on the place. I've got a lot to say, so, and I didn't write anything down, I'm just winging this. And uh, one of the parts of our museum that's very, very interesting is its haunted history. Yes. Now, I'm not, it's not haunted in a bad way. I don't want people to think of it in that way at all. But I kind of have to be careful sometimes when we have children at the museum and I want to tell them about it because I found that some of them were sensitive about so I could be I gotta be careful who the audience is. But anyway, in nineteen forty we had a firefighter named Bob Knight. He was only twenty two years old. He was only on the job for two weeks at that particular fire station, at which back back then was Fire Station 3. And this was in 1940, he had only two weeks on the job. I heard he was a boxer, and he had a great personality and really a really great guy. Well, one day they got a call on a day that was a nasty day, windy, thunderstorms, it was just a nasty day. And they got a call to a house fire. So he gets on the truck, and um, in, in matter of fact, it was a truck very much like the one that's outside. So you had the lieutenant and the driver in the cab, and the two firefighters would ride on the tailboard on the back. When they got to the call, Bob Knight, the new firefighter, stepped off the tailboard and died as soon as he stepped off the tailboard. He stepped into a puddle that had a live wire down. The wind had blown, the wind had blown a wire down and he was electrocuted on the spot. So strange things started happening at Fire Station 3 or the West Side Fire Station since that time. And uh, strange things, for example, I'll give you one example. One night, while everybody was sleeping, there was a lot of noise, banging and noise coming from the kitchen. Well, you saw on that video, you saw the kitchen. We did, did a major restore on that. But anyway, uh, there was a lot of noise coming from the kitchen. Now, there were four firefighters 
station to the station. Like I said, there's a lieutenant, the driver, and the two firefighters. Well, one night with all this banging going on, there were drawers opening and, and, and uh, drawers and cabinets opening and closing. So now firefighters love messing with each other. They love screwing with each other all the time and getting on each other's nerves and, and getting, just getting into each other's heads and messing with each other. Part of, part of the fun of the job, I guess. Well, so that night, while everybody was supposedly sleeping, the lieutenant, the captain or the lieutenant at that station is hearing all this noise and he is thinking, something's screwed up here. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to go check it out because I never hear noise like that coming out of there, so I want to find out what's going on. So he goes down to the kitchen to see if he can see who's doing this. Well, he gets to the kitchen and the drawers and cabinets were open, but there's nobody there. He didn't see anybody going to the kitchen. He didn't see anybody at the kitchen either. So he's trying to assess uh, what the heck is going on. And so the first thing that crosses his mind is, these guys are messing with me, man. I gotta find out what's going on. I don't know how they did it, but I'll, I'll find out. So he closes all the drawers and gets everything back to the way it's supposed to be. And he's heading back to his bed. And he, he's listening. He's listening for laughing. He's listening for snickering or something because uh, he thinks these guys uh, are listening, knowing what's going on. They're, they know he did this. So anyway, he doesn't hear any noise. He doesn't hear any snickering or anything. <laughs> so he wakes everybody up. He says, okay. Or, or he thinks he's waking everybody up because uh, he thinks they're awake. They're just messing with me. But, but everybody played stupid to the max. They played stupid. I don't know what you're talking about. Da, 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 da. So in the morning, while they, they go into the day room next to the kitchen to have breakfast, the lieutenant is asking a lot of questions. All right, enough of this. I know one of you guys, did. anyway, he, he's trying to uh, get somebody to say, admit something and then drop it. Nobody ever admitted anything. Everybody played stupid right to the end. Well, that's just one of the many incidences. Another time, a driver, uh, 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 he was a lieutenant then, uh, who was a friend of mine. I actually worked with this guy at that station. He went to bed one night, and before we go to bed, we usually, you know, make sure we put all our stuff next to our bed, our radio, and our whatever we need next to the bed. So when we get up to run a call, we just grab our whatever we need and go. So he puts all his stuff there, and he turns off his light to go to sleep. Well, at 3:30 in the morning, for example, a call comes in. So the bells go off and the speaker goes off and all that stuff. So he turns on his light to go get his stuff and, get, and put his boots on and get ready to go. Well, when he turned on the light, he was ticked off immediately because all his stuff was all over the place. It was all over the floor. None of his stuff was where he put it. And so he, he, he kind of got ticked off pretty quick. And anyway, so he, they all go out to the truck to run the call. And on the way to the call, naturally, he's asking, all right, what, you know, what happened? Da, 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 da. And he's questioning everybody. And again, everybody's playing dumb. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. What? I don't know what's up with you. I don't know, what's, what's your problem? Anyway, so again it happened. So anyway, to go on and on, this stuff like that kept going on and on through the years, through the years. In fact, the president of our fire museum now had something like that happen to her too. So, so, because uh, she was at the fire, the fire station closed as a fire station in 2005. No, and that was 2005. Yeah, 2005. And she was there but before then. So she did have something happen all the way, all the way up to 
the end where the fire station was no longer a fire station. Stuff was kept happening. I could give you other incidences, but I'll leave you this. On our fire museum website, you can go on to the Fort Lauderdale Fire Museum website and there is an actual DVD of the people who had these incidences happen to them being interviewed and them telling about it. And these, honest to God, these are people I do know, I really did work with, and I trust. So I, I really have no reason to doubt them. Now I was stationed there too, and I knew that the station was haunted, but I wanted something to happen. I was hoping something would happen. Because I wanted to say, wow, that happened to me. I wish I, wish I wanted something to talk about. I would like to be part of that. I'd like to, anyway. But it never did happen. My theory was, because I believed it already was haunted, nothing happened to me. Because mm -hmm. I noticed that all the people that this happened to were people who don't believe in that kind of thing. So all the people that had this happen were ones who uh, never believed any of this stuff in the first place. So they were the ones that are the the ones that can tell the story now. So anyway, I just thought I had to throw that in there because that's a, uh, a very interesting uh, piece of our history that, uh, that I like to share about because I, I really find it interesting. And you know, he was, <clears throat> he was our uh, first in the line of death um, person, you know, in the line of duty death. So I thought that was really interesting. So, um, I also have another video that I want to show you that goes, it ties in with the video we just saw. Now, this, now the, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. Because the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department came to be in 2012. Now, in 2011, the uh, city of Fort Lauderdale did not have a fire department. And much like the Titanic, uh, they thought we'll be okay, nothing's gonna happen. Well, uh, it did happen. The city caught fire, no fire department, no organization at all. And back then, all you had was telegraph, you, did, you know, so they had uh, well, they I made I had telephone too. I don't, but they had to call in um, uh, fire help from other fire departments, which were far away. We didn't have paved roads and everything back then. A lot of dirt roads and stuff. So it took a while for us to get help at the at the city to fight the fire. So you didn't have a whole lot to work with by the time everybody showed up. So anyway, they finally decide, okay, we have to have a fire department. So uh, this next video is going to show the origins and it's, it's going to also show a lot about how the fire department developed. Now it's very much like Hollywood, Holly, all, all, almost most of our fire departments work alike. So if, you, if you're not familiar with how fire departments work, this video is, is, gives a good uh, show of the history of how it came to be and, and how it is now. And it'll, it'll even, if it, even though it's not the city of Hollywood Fire Department, much of it is alike. So I'm going to need someone to help me with the, that next video. Did you press play yet? Yeah, thank you. Who we are now. Oh, 
will begin. 100 years ago, Fort Lauderdale was a new city just on the verge. Can everybody hear it okay? Because of a major planning flaw, the city experienced the setback that killed its budding business district and left residents scrambling to put the pieces back together. Around midnight on June 2nd, 1912, a small fire began in the town's most imposing building, the H.G. Wheeler Mercantile. With no fire department to call on, the small fire quickly got out of control and eventually burned a large portion of this very young city. After the great fire, uh, the Uncle Hotel burnt to the ground uh, several months later. So I think the citizens got together and started a fire. Uh, it's all they need. And uh, 100 years later, here we are. The Fort Lauderdale that we know today is a city that has risen from the ashes of this great tragedy. Uh, from its founding in 1912 until today, it's made tremendous uh, advancements, tremendous achievements. It has gone from a, uh, a startup department that uh, you know, went from a single fire station in a downtown location to now being a regional fire department that has uh, everything from you know, the fire rescue, the emergency services, to transport, to uh, the hook and ladder, to being able to rescue somebody out of a high rise or rescue somebody that might be in the intercoastal or in the, in the river. So, the fire department has certainly developed over the years and grown into a full-service unit and one that, again, uh, we are extremely proud of. The incredible and storied history of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department began in June of 1912, when the city purchased its first fire equipment. Earl H. Will, Frank Craybill, and Fred Beatty were among the first brave men to become volunteer firefighters and start the proud lineage of men and women that serve today as part of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. Fort Lauderdale is a very unique, very unique organization. And uh, you know, I look back at the individuals that have retired from here, and there's no regret. There's a lot of pride in who we are as an organization, what we do, how we do it, uh, why we do it in the community we serve. We have an honest desire to want to work for the city of Fort Lauderdale. And I think you see it in the way we, we do our job. I travel all over the country, and, and quite frankly, over here as well, and I put our folks up against it. The Fort Lauderdale Fire Department has been recognized for decades as one of the state leaders in fire prevention. This dates back to the 1940s, when the fire department held losses to zero for the months of May and June of 1940. This was remarkable considering they answered 55 fire alarms in the month of May alone. at the Everglades Fertilizer Plant. Those who fought it, many of whom were young firefighters at the time, will not forget it. I was home, and I got called back in to the Everglades Fertilizer Fire. And I went downtown, and then I stayed down there until they sent me over to the Everglades Fertilizer with a, a crew. And I worked with the men over there, and we got the fire out. For years, the department's focus was on fire suppression and prevention. However, the 1990s brought significant change and expansion to the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. In 1995, Engine 3 and Engine 8 were the first advanced life support units to go into service. This allows firefighters to provide life-saving services in the field. Uh, I started as a paramedic, a lot of things that we do now were unheard of in the street. We do 12 EKGs and 
and, and, and getting some of the medicines that we get now is really unheard of. You know, nowadays we have been a lot more freedom to uh, give advanced treatments in the field and, and make a difference for the people that we serve. By the late 90s, the fire department began full EMS services with 10 rescue transport units and added 12 fire and rescue dispatchers to the communications division. We're running 14 medical rescue units right now. Those are ALS ambulances with fire capability, stable firefighter paramedics. Uh, also, every one of our engines, every one of our ladders is also ALS capable. The EMS Bureau has been the biggest growth. We did strictly fire. We went into the EMS Bureau approximately 10 years ago. That was a major uh, growth for the department, as well as growing our special operations team. Uh, we're a very progressive department. Uh, there are studies out there that show a certain procedure works. We're going to be the first one to implement that procedure. We've got the latest and greatest tools that we use for our patients. Um, anything out there that's going to be beneficial to the public that you can pretty much guarantee that we're going to be the, the department that's going to use it first. With the heat, hurricanes, and massive waterways flowing through this great city, you have to be prepared for anything. Because of this, the Special Operations Divisions and Bureaus was developed, allowing natural and man-made disasters to be met head-on with skill, bravery, and technology. The duties of the brave men and women include not only firefighting and prevention, but also ocean rescue, hazardous materials, advanced life support, technical rescue, airport rescue, marine team, SWAT medic, urban search and rescue, light technical rescue, as well as honor guard and color guard. Over 450 men and women make up these departments that serve in many capacities to keep this city safe. What sets us apart from other fire and rescue departments across the country is the state-of-the-art equipment. Brand new stations, brand new equipment, brand new fire truck, training. The department is growing, it's always changing. That's the one thing I've noticed. This department does not take anything granted. They bring in uh, the best equipment possible for the fire truckers. I think our, our biggest advances have been protecting one another. I think our new air packs have the ability for the chief officer to keep track. This is a pulse sense unit, it's, it's actually part of the air pack. And it has a uh, receiver that the officers outside, chief officers usually handle it outside. And it can monitor all the trucks. You know, so they go on it and click on it and scroll through and see where everybody's air supplies are at. If uh, they're down, they'll send a signal to the officers as well so they know that, hey, we need to send some data search for these groups and find them. So those, those type of technologies, I think, you know, and I think that's really going to be the wave of the future. This advanced equipment has resulted in an incredible safety record. Uh, I think we've got a very good safety record for a department of our size. Uh, firefighter safety is paramount. When you think about how many of the larger fire departments are the same size as our departments have lost people in the line of duty, and ours is rather small, one too. I think uh, we're pretty proud that we've been able to, to hold that number of only two firefighters in a hundred years. Uh, we have these uh, medallions that we're putting outside the buildings now, and that's the result of a, a tragedy up in the middle of the state of Florida where several firefighters lost their lives. And what these uh, medallions indicate, uh, the roof is comprised of lightweight truss system. What the intention is, is that when our firefighters pull up on the scene and they have a fire, they have to consider that roof construction and the fact that it may not hold up well in the fire conditions. What began as a small volunteer fire department 100 years ago has now become one of the busiest fire and rescue departments in the country. Fort Lauderdale runs about an average of 42,000 calls a year. Of those, I'd say 80% are medical calls. When a 911 call is forwarded to the Fort Lauderdale Fire and Rescue Department, immediate action is taken to get the call dispatched to the appropriate station. 1300 West Brown at the police station, we have smoke on the third floor. The stations are notified as to the type of call that is coming in with an advanced color-coded light system. Dispatch uses the latest in communications technology to stay in constant contact with the trucks at all times. This has led to some of the fastest response times in the state. When the bell goes off, when the cell goes off, go downstairs and be in your truck and be ready to go. 
for the majority, because the way our stations are laid out and the amount of personnel that we have, we can get an arriving unit in six minutes or less to the new call. And then we can start mitigating the problem and continue from there. As a coastal city, often referred to as the Venice of America, many of the city's rescues revolve around water. In 2004, the Fort Lauderdale Beach Patrol, which was formerly a part of the Parks and Recreation Department, was moved into the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department and officially became the Ocean Rescue Division. Uh, right off the bat, we got all new first aid kits. We were all required to get first responder training which was a step up from the regular and standard first aid class that we've had. We've uh, created a 10% pay raise incentive for our lifeguards to get uh, EMT training, take our water tests, which includes a 500 meter ocean swim in 10 meters or less, with a 50 meter swim to tow in an unconscious uh, beach patron in two minutes to make it to the person. So it's been a, it's been a big jump in the level of uh, professionalism. We were able to expand our beach uh, by roughly three quarters of a mile. We got five additional lifeguard towers, and we were able to add two new lieutenant positions, as well as 15 new lifeguard positions. So it was, a, it was definitely a positive change for us as a department. We average somewhere between five and seven million beach patrons every year, um, and we've had maybe two drowning deaths in the last 26 years. So we'll put those statistics up against just about anybody. We believe that our lifeguards are some of the best trained in South Florida, if not the country. Community outreach expands beyond the city of Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale Fire Department has 16 sister cities around the globe. They are able to share their expertise to help other cities stay safe as well. Those are cities in, that don't operate like they do in the United States, and they're level of training in their equipment and uh, the challenges that they face are much more dramatic than we have here. So whatever they can glean from us or whatever we can provide for them to keep them safe and keep their citizens safe, we're more than happy to have that uh, culture exchange. The men and women of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department go beyond the call of duty. They show compassion for those in need outside of our community. When the earthquake took place in Haiti, there was a young girl that was a victim. Um, not at the earthquake, but a, uh, a truck struck her. It happened for her to be transported here to the States to get treatment. I was on shift that day, and I was able to transport her from the airport to the hospital. So she was here for approximately three months. My wife and I, we went to see her almost every day. We made her feel comfortable. She had no family here. And I had the honor of bringing her back home to her parents in Haiti when she was fully recovered. All right, here goes the first responder. Here they go. Tunnel to Towers Run, uh, the second annual here held in Fort Lauderdale, started in 2002 in New York City uh, to memorialize the legacy of Stephen Siller, who uh, lost his life on September 11th. Uh, he ran through the battery tunnel with his gear on, is why we wear the gear. There's no choice. He strapped 65 pounds of gear on his back, he ran through the tunnel to the towers where he gave up his life while saving others. Stephen is my hero. Firefighters work 24 hours on and 48 hours off. During their 24-hour shift, they live at the fire station Cooking together and sharing meals creates camaraderie and an extended family. The kitchen is kind of a teaching thing, it's a fellowship thing, and it's a way of hanging out and enjoying each other's company. When we come on shift, uh, we collect money for food, and we basically shop uh, whatever is available for us. That we decide on what we want to cook. You also find out everyone's personality. Sometimes it's good at that. For the last 100 years, in times of crisis, this great city has called on the brave men and women of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. Very few people will ever understand what it means to be a firefighter. Because of this, these men and women share a special bond. Everybody always asks you what's the worst thing you've ever seen. And uh, you usually spare them the details because it's not what they want to hear. They want to hear either the biggest fire or the goriest car accident. Uh, so I think that getting back to the station and cutting up is really what gets you through the 24 hours. It usually makes for some great stories, most of which can be told. The department for me has been like a family. 
I had an accident many years ago, and um, they were all there for me. I was at a work for over, I believe, a year and a half. I was off shift, and everyone donated time to me. They came and visited me when I was in the hospital. After my final surgery, there was 11 trucks outside. There was no rescues, there was engine, there was a ladder, fire chiefs, there was inspectors, and they were all standing outside waiting for me to come out after my surgery. And that to me was an incredible feeling. Like I knew, wow, I said, I never knew how many people really cared. As firefighters, we do make a difference. We've changed people's lives, we've saved people, and we do this a lot. As firefighters, I think that most of us are, are the type that want to help people, and that's why we got into this business. I know it, it worked out for me because we do make a difference, and we always have. I think the talent pool that we have for personnel is extraordinary. Uh, Fort Lauderdale is a great city to work for, there's no doubt about it. It's uh, 100 years of tradition. It's been a privilege for me, uh, it's been extraordinary. Becoming a firefighter is not a job. It is a life calling. The dedicated men and women of our fire and rescue departments put their lives at risk every day to protect our families, our neighbors, and our community. It takes sacrifice, determination, and dedication. If you are a new firefighter, or have ever considered this honorable profession, listen to the words of advice from the individuals that have come before you. I would say the best advice I could give any young person that wanted to be a fireman is study hard. Pay attention to your loss. Don't quit. Do your best. Wonderful career. Be positive. Train every day. Respect the people that you work with. Pick out a winner and stick with them. Just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Nose clean. If you want a rewarding career to watch yourself grow and be able to give to the community, this is the career for you. We are Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. On behalf of the city of Fort Lauderdale, I want to thank our men and women of our fire department for their service to our community and for the tremendous sacrifice that they have made over the years. As I've said many times, I think we have the finest fire department uh, anywhere in the state of Florida. Outstanding group of young men and women who are just uh, dedicated to preserving and protecting our community. You know, we go to bed every night uh, knowing that our fire department is here to keep us safe, keep us secure, and to protect our homes, protect our families, to allow us to enjoy this great quality of life that we have here in the city of Fort Lauderdale. So again, on behalf of the city of Fort Lauderdale, thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, and just keep up the great work. We are so proud of the job that you do day in and day out on our behalf. Hey, thank you. Um, now, even though that was the city of Fort Lauderdale Fire Department, also consider that Hollywood, the guys in Hollywood, the women in Hollywood, are doing the same thing. So, you know, just think of it in general as firefighters in general. Um, now also back with the fire museum, uh, many of you uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but I really, really would hope that we can get you out to the fire museum. We are fully volunteer. We're a 501c. We're fully volunteer, so we, you know, kind of uh, survive on donations and uh, visits. And up here we have uh, a, a donation thing. I also have information here about our about our fire museum and stuff for kids. We don't have any kids here. I brought stuff for kids. We don't have any kids here, but uh, I like you to, you know, check that out. Is that in the area where the old town is? 
for the historical areas? Yes, but it's in Sailboat Bend. Do any of you know where the swing bridge is in Fort Lauderdale? Mm -hmm. It's 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 a very old bridge, and it's it's right by there. The mechanical one that goes up and down. No, this one swing. It's a swing bridge. It actually swings around. Mm -hmm. In fact, that swing bridge once upon a time was done manually. So every time a boat wanted to come through, the bridge tender would have to walk out of his little, uh, house. little house there. He'd have to walk out into the middle and manually turn this wheel and, and, and to turn that thing around. And I don't know how many times he had to turn it to get a full, full opening. But then he had to wait for the boat to go past. And then he had to go and undo it again. Now imagine on a day like today. 90s, or I don't know what it is today, and, and if, uh, with the humidity and having to do that several times a day. Or imagine doing that job uh, on a rainy, rainy day, having, you know, you know just, uh. anyway, now today it's uh, electric, so he, he doesn't have to move. He just hits a switch and handles it right there. Uh, yes? I just want to say, uh two things. I, I would like to thank you. As a former Brooklyn, New Yorker, I visited your museum when you volunteers opened your museum for, for me to see. And I wanted to thank you for having a 9-11 exhibit. I was 12 years old when it happened. And I'm, I'm 34 now. Right. And uh, a lot of fire museums don't have those kind of exhibits. And to see that your fine museum has a 9-11 exhibit is very appreciative as a, a former Brooklyn, New Yorker. And I do have a question. Uh, you said you lost two heroes in the line of duty. What happened to the uh, second hero? Uh, you know, I, 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 I feel bad about saying that, but I really never learned what it was. I just know I don't know how I didn't learn that. You have homework tonight. Yeah, I have homework. <laughs> you know, uh, I guess the the uh, Bob Knight, with all of the story around him, just overshadowed everything. Yes. I have a question that always bothered me. When 9/11 happened, people were trying to come down the steps, and the firemen were going up. Now. I wondered if that was a good idea, because if they were blocking the stairs as people were trying to, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, yes, I do know what you're talking about, but that was kind of an out of control situation. Yeah. When you think about that, the firefighters that arrived on scene, their job was to... It wasn't their fault, but I'm just thinking, right. who called that? People are trying to get down, and you're going up there, and the stairways were narrow from what I heard. You have to, simply put, you have to do whatever you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed to me, you know, they yeah. could have been saved, the firemen could have been saved, and maybe more people could have come down. Well, I'll tell you what. If that, you know, if it ever happened again like that, I wonder if the call would be a little different. Well, I'm sure, okay, we learn from all of our experiences. Uh, up until that 9-11 uh, happened, we never had anything like that. Uh, let's face it, never had anything like that. So you, so you do what you can, learn from it. Now, if that were to happen again, we will have learned. And so it's based on what we learned from that. Here's, they're going to change the protocol, and they're going to do things different. It's a shame for all the firemen to die when they weren't even in the building, and these people, you know, were trying yeah. to get out. No, the whole thing was a shame. Yeah. Wow. The, the whole, yes. I was just wondering, actually, the other day, so it's interesting that you're doing this today. Um, you know, back in the day, I, I called and I, I saw an accident one time, a, a bicyclist got hit by a car, and I called in with my cell phone, and I had to manually give them my ad the address or location where I was. I was wondering, do does, do they? And this might be out of your realm, because it's probably I guess the nine one one operators. But 
do you still have to give the address or do they actually zoom into your phone and know exactly where you are and, and you know that's much more efficient to know where people okay. are. Okay, yes, where, but where the, the technology is. The dispatchers have a protocol they have to follow. They have questions they have to ask and they have to ask them in the order. Uh, and so they try to stick with the plan as much as they can. They want to hear a voice tell them where they are. That yes, they also have GPS to work with, but they don't want to rely on that as their only, they, they want to get as many uh, inputs as they can to put it all together. And, and so they, they have to ask. Uh, so that's just part of, the, part of what they have to do. Uh, yes. What is the actual address of the museum? Like the street address. Okay, that's 1022 uh, West Las Olas Boulevard. Now, I ho I would like everyone, when we're done, to come up here and get some of the materials here because it 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 has a lot of information. Some that I didn't cover today, and. Uh, we'd like you to visit and this will give you a, a lot of information and um, one of the other uh, I've got so much to say but um, one of the uh, remember I told you that we have a little bit of a haunted history we have another little piece of haunted history that I didn't mention and that is that um, some years back we had a fire right down West Los Olas Boulevard, about five houses down from where our fire station is. And they, there was a fire there. The history of that fire is that a woman who had two daughters had something that she wanted to do, a place she wanted to go. And uh, a, a, I forgot what the exact circumstances were, some kind of party, some get together somewhere, somehow. So she left her two daughters at home by themselves and then went out to do whatever it is she wanted to do. Well, the house caught fire, to make a, I'll make a long story short, the house caught fire, the two daughters passed away in the fire and at the fire museum we actually have uh, the story on the wall with pictures showing our firefighters uh, taking the girls out of the house through an upstairs window and both of the girls died uh, they both died of smoke inhalation. Uh, well, anyway, the um, remember I told you that some of the firefighters heard voices, not voices, they heard all these noises. Well, some of the firefighters also talked of hearing voices, but the voices of children. But every time they heard the voices, they always went out to look and where they tried to follow the voices to see where they're coming from. Like, are they outside? Where are they? I can hear them. But they could never see them. Now, the two girls, this is all speculation, of course. The two girls, um, before they passed away, they were, uh, I think they were six and eight years old. They used to play at the fire station because our fire station had a big yard where the, our fire station is right on the corner had a big yard with trees and and all the stuff and the kids used to come and play and bling their dogs and all that other stuff and so it's thought it's thought that the uh, children were coming back to where they where they used to play uh, what I didn't mention was we also had paranormal groups come back back some years back paranormal activity was very very popular and on TV there was a lot of paranormal shows and we had those paranormal groups go to the fire museum and they actually did uh, 
see Bob Knight and feel Bob Knight, who I told you about. And they also said, I didn't see the video. I don't know. I don't know what how they do this. They have all this in, intricate equipment. But they said that one of the girls was seen uh, standing in the lieutenant's room doorway uh, by these paranormal groups. Yes. What happened with the mother? Was she held responsible? Okay, I, young children? I, you know what? I really don't know all the details about what happened to her. Uh, I don't know what legally happened, but all I know is that when she came back home and realized that her, her house was burned out and her daughters were dead, and imagine having to live with that, even if she didn't go to jail. I cannot even imagine how hurtful it is to live with no with that. I I, oof, I can't even Did imagine. Did the cause of the fire? Or I I I don't know the cause of the fire. Um, somebody told dispatch that they thought that someone had thrown a mocked off cocktail. I don't see that. I don't believe that. I don't know how the fire started. I don't know if the girls did it. I don't know. Don't know the details. Yeah. You know, it could be said five fighters are the guardians of life. You know, and with the ghosts in the museum, you could be guardians of the spirits. You know, they could feel safe there. So, you know, you know, yeah. it's a place you of know, safety. Yeah, it's one. Of, it's one of those things that nobody can ever prove anything. Yeah. You can only wonder. It's 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 a it's a thing of wonder, really. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, um, please, uh, if you get a chance, do come up. And please, uh, oh, please. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. And we also can do donations by scanning that to those of you who know how to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, was glad, I was glad I was able to come out and speak with you. And uh, a little afterwards, you could uh, go outside and check out our truck. As you saw in some of those videos, that truck was in the videos. You know, uh, the both videos that that truck was in. That truck's been around a while. So, right. well, thank you very much, y'all.